the second Sunday of Easter. And our psalm is Psalm 148. And it reads, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command. Well, that's, that's, that's happening. <laughs> Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. There ends the reading. So I'm sure he's used to that. 
So. Actually, the, the 20 year olds are the baby. Yeah, oh, yeah. Randy. Okay. yeah, Randy's family. But good to have you. Very musically uh, talented, along with his brothers. They got a band. And Arbor Creek. Arbor Creek, yes. Good stuff. So, also, I'm a new grandfather. We had uh, Lucia born. And, uh, you should have the uh, PowerPoint yeah. number. But her name is Lucia. So, it's uh, an Italian name for, I think, Lucy. Is that right? Yeah. Italian for Lucy. Oh, Lucy. Yeah. Oh, Lucy. Yeah. Oh, Lucy. Yeah. Yeah. Any other announcements that we should be aware of? Okay. We do have a birthday, but we're not going to talk about it. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to mention it. The show. We just don't want to sing about it. No. Can we just sing anonymously? No. no. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> last, week, no. last week, I think that you have to no, sing. No, 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 no. She'll walk out. Well, no, she will. Just she she will sing. We won't walk even out. Make... All right. Anyway, yeah, good to see everybody, <laughs> and uh, putting our trust in one, to one pair of hands is what God is all about. So, right, amen to that. Amen. Ready? Amen. Yeah. Hopefully. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Celebrate God in this sacred space. Celebrate God in all places under heaven. Give praise for God's mighty deeds. Give praise for God's resurrecting power. Praise God with a fanfare of trumpets. Praise God with a harp and a cello. Praise God with tambourines and dancing. Praise God with flutes and guitars. Praise God with cymbals and drums. Let everything with life and breath praise God. The violin's not in there. Yeah, really. Praise God with a violin. Wrote this up. Praise God for two. The crowd's kind of wild this morning. A little bit. A little bit.
So let us open ourselves to God in confession, trusting the Lord's desire to give us peace. God, God the empty tomb and our empty hearts, when we are afraid to speak our faith in the world, forgive us and help us to find our voice. When we are afraid to forgive and to love again, forgive us and give us the power to forgive. When we are afraid to stand up to misguided authority, join with the weak to make us all strong. When we are confined by our hearts, touch us with your wounded hands and set us free. When we are locked behind our doubts and fears, pass through our barricades, open our hearts, and give us peace. Amen. Christ comes with healing light into our locked places and shadowy hurts, resurrecting our spirits and breathing into us new life. As God's own forgiven people, go to bring peace, forgiveness, and the new life to the world in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please share the peace with one another. Peace be with you. The first lesson is from the fifth chapter of Acts. Now many signs and wonders were done among the people through the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared to join them, but the people held them in high esteem. Yet more than ever believers were added to the Lord, great numbers of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats in order that Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he came by. A great number of people would also <coughs> gather from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all cured. Then the high priest took action, he and all who were with him, that is, the sect of the Sadducees, Sadducee. thank you, being filled with jealousy, arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and tell the people the whole message about this life. The second lesson is from the first chapter of Revelation. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priest serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother, who share with you in Jesus the persecution and the kingdom and the patient endurance, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the heaven, seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to per Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see those voice it was that spoke to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white as white wool, white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet were like burnished bronze, refined as a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining with full force. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Here ends the reading. Please stand for the gospel. <coughs> Holy 
Gospel is from John chapter 20. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Now when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of his nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. So a week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, <coughs> and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So we're now entering into the whole post-Easter time in which we celebrate uh, the magnitude and the wonders of the resurrection. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of resurrection stories, not only in the scriptures, but in people's lives. Last week we had that first resurrection story it was read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, where the women are going to the tomb. You know the story. Mary Magdalene and her crew going down there to see if they can find the body of Jesus. And they get there and the stone is rolled away. They're kind of blown away by the fact that there's an empty tomb. And then all of a sudden, there's two angelic-like men standing in front of them. Now think about it. What would you do? If you saw these kind of angelic-like creatures standing in front of you, and they say, why are you afraid? Are you looking for the dead? The dead are not here. Go and look for the one who lives. I mean, I'll tell you, those women were kind of blown away, but that's the power of the resurrection. Right there from the very beginning, anytime you're dealing with the power of the resurrection, sometimes strange, extraordinary things start to happen. Visions, things are seen that are not normally seen. And what these women experienced, they went back and told the disciples, and even the disciples said, you've been doing something that you shouldn't be doing, <laughs> pretty much. What have you been smoking type of stuff, you know? I mean, that's the power of the resurrection. Sometimes it's very hard to believe what the resurrection can do and the power that's behind it. And of course, you know, you continue on with the resurrection stories. You've got that marvelous, on the same day, it says two men are walking to a small town just outside Jerusalem, about seven miles away, and that little town is called Emmaus. The walk to Emmaus, which all the walk to Emmaus weekends are based on that particular story in Luke as well. And these two gentlemen are talking about all that's transpired. The fact that this Jesus, who claimed to be the Son of God, you know, was uh, doing all sorts of fantastic ministry, but he just happened to be crucified and died and buried. And now they talk about the stone being rolled away. And there's a great mystery going on. What's happening? And these two men are like really down and despairing and they're wondering what's going on and what God is doing here. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Jesus appears to them, but they don't recognize him because he's in his resurrection form. 
And Jesus starts talking to them and says, hey, can I walk with you guys? <clears throat> so he walks with them and Jesus starts to uh, unveil to them all that's written in the scriptures. And these two men are enlightened by what Jesus has to say. And they're so amazed that they say, hey, why don't you come and stay with us for the evening and have dinner with us? Well, Jesus says yes. And he sits down with them and then he breaks the bread <clears throat> and says words of blessing. And exactly at the time that he says the words of blessing as he breaks the bread, the men, these two men, suddenly realize who was sitting with them, and it was Jesus. And as soon as they recognize him, Jesus is gone. Because anytime you're dealing with the power of the resurrection, strange things happen that don't normally happen, and they happen in ways that don't normally make sense. And these two men are just left with what they call kind of like a burning sensation in their hearts. And Jesus is gone. And I'm saying to myself, oh my gosh, this is the post-resurrection Jesus. And he's actually eating a meal. Which means that he has a digestive system. You know, he's not cast by the ghost where it goes into his mouth and falls to the ground. So how does this happen? How does this post-resurrection Jesus who can walk through walls and suddenly appear and disappear still have a regular digestive system that he can eat solid food. You know what I'm talking about? Strange stuff happens when you're dealing with the power of the resurrection. And talk about walking through walls. I mean, our gospel lesson today, I mean, these disciples that same evening uh, naturally are scared, you know, and... Uh, they're in this room by themselves because they know that the authorities are looking for them. And they're behind closed doors, which means that the windows are shut, the doors are closed. And then all of a sudden, without the opening of a window or a door, Jesus is standing among them. He just kind of like appears. He's in his post-resurrection form. He can actually walk through walls and appear in front of people in the same room. And yet at the same time, he's a flesh. Because he invites people to literally take their fingertips, like as he, as he did with Thomas, and put their fingertips into the holes in his hands and into the hole in the side of his body where they pierced him. So he had to be a flesh at the same time. How does that happen? How can a person be a flesh and yet able to walk through walls? That's what the power of the resurrection is all about. When Jesus resurrected, he unleashed a certain power into this world that has never been duplicated. It's called the resurrection power of our Lord, our Father, that came through and been made available to us through Jesus Christ that has done wondrous things ever since it occurred on that first Easter day. And of course, one of those wondrous things is the day of Pentecost. Now, you did notice in our gospel lesson today that Jesus did say, peace be with you, and he unleashes the Holy Spirit on them. But remember, it was on the day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit was unleashed for the whole world in the magnitude that God intended. Jesus even says in the Gospel of John, the time is going to come when I must go so that the Holy Spirit can come in the magnitude of what God intended it to come. And the Holy Spirit coming in the magnitude that it did on Pentecost was all part of that resurrection power experience that God intended. It's all part of that, that power that God unleashed on the face of this earth. And you know the story of Pentecost. Talk about a crazy resurrection experience. I mean, what would it be like if all of us were standing here, you know, 12 of us or whatever, and all of a sudden we started speaking languages that we have never spoken before. And it just so happened that pilgrims, you know, let's say that the Simca Center was like a pilgrim in place, okay? And people were coming from all over the world to the Simca Center you know, from all walks of life. And we, were, we just started, each one of us, you know, Ted and, 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 and Cheryl and whatever, we just started speaking languages that we have never spoken before. And some of the pilgrims walk by in the hallway and say, well, I, I hear my language, you know. 
some African language or some Asian language or whatever. That's what happened. When they were speaking in tongues, they were actually speaking languages that they had never spoken before. You tell me how that happens. That is crazy stuff. But when the power of the resurrection is combined with the Holy Spirit, extraordinary <laughs> things start to happen. And that's what God intended. Before that Easter day, that power, that Holy Spirit of power was not available to the likes of you and I. No. It was given out, it was doled out, it was, you know, dripped here and there, but in a carte blanche manner, it was not available to the everyday person like you and I. And what's amazing about it is that once that book of Acts starts, you start to get into some of these strange stories. I mean, our lesson for today from the book of Acts, I mean, think about it. Peter apparently was so full of this new power that his, his shadow, apparently when his shadow would cover somebody, they would be healed. So, so apparently what they did is they lined the streets, you know, with, with the sun on one side, and, and Peter, with the sun to his back, apparently would, would walk along the street, and wherever his shadow was cast, people would be healed. It says in, in our lesson there, right, they came from miles around, and they lined the streets with the crippled, the sick, the dying, and when his shadow was cast upon that person, they would actually be healed. Can you imagine if you brought your crippled son and daughter and you laid them along the road and, and Peter walked by and his shadow was cast upon you and your son and daughter and you thank Peter and the next thing you know, that crippled son and daughter was standing next to you, holy, cleansed, and clean, saying, Mom, Dad, I love you. Can you imagine the magnitude of what transpired? Folks, that's what we're talking about in our Acts lesson for today, that Peter had this extraordinary power made available to him through the resurrection of Jesus Christ at that particular time in his life, that wherever his shadow was cast, people were healed. I just find that to be mind-boggling. But not any crazier than the next story that's found in chapter 8 in the book of Acts, where Philip baptizes, what? An Ethiopian eunuch. Now, what is that all about? I mean, you know, you talk about the craziness of God's resurrection calling you to do crazy things. Uh, you know, God says, Peter, I mean, uh, uh, Philip, of course I'm partial to Philip because I was at St. Philip Lutheran in, in Glenview. But Phil, I want you to go down the road from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is kind of a crazy road anyway, and uh, it heads south towards Africa. And uh, <laughs> it just goes, and he finds this, you know what a eunuch is, don't you? I mean, he finds this Ethiopian eunuch who is apparently uh, part of, uh, you know, pretty upscale, you know, for the queen of Ethiopia or whatever. And, and, and he's reading the scriptures, this Ethiopian eunuch, and, and, and Philip goes up and says, dude, what are you reading? And he says, well, I'm reading Isaiah. And, and he says, uh, I, I, I want to be baptized. <laughs> so he baptizes this Ethiopian eunuch, and as soon as he's baptized, and Philip's done his job, Philip is transported to another place. And what's that all about? Folks, this stuff actually happened. This stuff actually happened. It's not like some sort of fairy tale. The casting of the shadows, the Ethiopian unit. This stuff actually happened. It's in the scriptures. That's what the power of God can do. It sometimes calls you, like Philip, to strange places to do strange things. In crazy ways to crazy people. Believe me, I've been there, done that in my ministry over the years. You see, that's the power of the resurrection. And then immediately following that chapter, which is chapter 8, you get into chapter 9, the conversion of St. Paul. Oh my gosh, 
that is such a powerful story about the <clears throat> resurrection. It, every time I read it, it just blows me away. St. Paul, or, you know, Saul was a yeah. crazy guy. Yeah. I mean, he had it all together. He had money, he had whatever. He was on the wrong side of the tracks, you might say. Tough dude. And yet, he's going to Damascus to probably arrest Ananias, who was a Christian leader in Damascus, and bring him back to Jerusalem where Ananias and his crew would probably be tortured and put to death. That's what, he was a bounty hunter. And so, here he is in all his glory on a horse, and Jesus appears, the resurrected Jesus appears to him and knocks him off his high horse and blinds him. And all of a sudden, this mighty Saul of Tarsus, this big shot guy, is humbled to his knees. And God says to him, this resurrected Christ says to him, go to Damascus, and there you will find a man named Ananias and ask him to lay hands on you because you are now blind and unless you go and get those scales removed from your eyes you will be blind forever. So Paul in his humble way moved by the power of the resurrection goes to Damascus and allows Ananias to lay hands on him. Can you imagine what Ananias was going through? knowing that this was the same Saul of Tarsus who was coming to get him and bring him back to have him, you know, tortured and, and, and killed. But Ananias does what he's supposed to do under the power of the Holy Spirit, and Paul is cleansed and changed for the rest of his life. And today, we spend hours going over those marvelous letters of the New Testament that he wrote that New Testament would be empty, null and void, if the power of the resurrection had not changed that man's life in such a dramatic way. Think about that. We just have the Gospels and Revelation, and that's about it. <gasps> yeah. And we wouldn't have Christian theology. Paul, our, th our theology, I've told you this before, is Pauline, based on Christ, but it's Pauline. He's the one who took everything Christ did and turned it into a theology that we use today. Unbelievable. That's chapter 9. And then in chapter 10, oh my gosh, you got the conversion of St. Peter. Peter, unlike Paul, was a little bit more specific when it came to his type of evangelism. Peter was still into kind of like, uh, yeah, you want to become a Christian? Well, you better become a Jew first, and then you can become a Christian. <laughs> Which means that you might have to be circumcised. Ooh, eh, you know, you're not going to get too many people to convert to Christianity if you ask them to be circumcised first. You know what I'm talking about? But in chapter 10, you know, he was into all these rules and regulations. He's in the house of Cornelius in Caesarea. Somehow Cornelius has this vision himself, and Cornelius is a, a Gentile. And he, and he sends his servants to Joppa and says, bring this Paul back to my house. And his servants go, and this is all under the power of the Holy Spirit and resurrection, and, and his servants go get Paul, the mighty Paul, uh, uh, and Peter back, not Paul, but Peter back, brings him back, and while Peter is at uh, Cornelius' house, he goes up to uh, the flat top roof to pray, like they all did, and there God has this, this sheet. <laughs> Maybe it's one of Mike Lindell's sheets, you know, the Giza sheets. I don't yeah. know, you know Mike Lindell, the pillow guy? <laughs> Who knows? Maybe it was made out of the same cotton that the geese. You ever seen this Giza commercial? Oh, yeah, I use my cotton from the Giza. It's right between the Nile River and the top of Africa. Maybe it was a Giza sheet that came down. I don't know. Made from Giza cotton. But it was a white sheet 
and on this sheet were all these strange animals from all walks of life. And God says to Peter, you can eat them all. Well, I'm a Jew, man. There's only certain animals I'm supposed to eat. You can eat them all now. Yeah. Second time it happened. Yeah. Third time it happened. Now, when something happens in threes in the, in the Bible, it, it means God means business, okay? So after that, Peter says, you know what? He actually goes and starts preaching about the fact that I now believe that God shows no partiality. He doesn't play these discriminatory games that we've been playing for years. And anybody has access to God now, regardless of who they are. That's what you call the conversion of St. Peter. So right there in the book of Acts, you got between a few chapters, Philip and Paul and Peter. I mean, the power of the resurrected Jesus, influenced by the Holy Spirit, is just playing out in these people's lives. And then, of course, you get to the book of Revelation. <laughs> John of Patmos, which is what Cheryl just read, you know. All the strange signs and symbols. Now, John of Patmos is the same guy who wrote the Gospel of John, the beloved disciple. He's also the guy who wrote 1st and 2nd John, the letters, the love letters. Apparently, he's just been sent to Patmos, which is one of those uh, penal islands, you know, where they, you get sent. You ever see the movie Papillon? With uh, Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman? where they're uh, part of the French penal system, and, he, and they both get sent to, to this island off whatever, the African coast, and there they just live till they die. They don't need guards because there's sharks surrounding the waters, and they just are sent, and that's where they're sentenced to. You know? And that's where John of Patmos, being influenced by the power of the resurrection and the strange visions, you read Revelations, and it's full of visions and things that only the Holy Spirit can undo. It's amazing. And so, uh, you know, Lenny DeClue, my, my roommate, wrote a whole book in trying to interpret the book of Revelation. You know, I was able to get it. It says, the apocalypse is fixed on in dire stages of nuclear wars, followed by... Catastrophic, catastrophic disasters in nature before Armageddon when a heavenly army of the Messiah will uh, obliterate an evil kingdom of the Antichrist. Biblical prophecy is a direct voice of the ruling existence of our Creator, His salvation and wisdom in all things. This is a story that is told as it ponders events of the past, present, and future in much detail foretold by the divine word. Knowing Lenny, as I knew him as one of my roommates in college, and the fact that he was a born-again Christian. This is the guy that one time was a big drug dealer in SIU. I mean, he had more drugs and more money and more women than you wanted to talk about, and he had a conversion experience through the resurrected Jesus, and came to know Christ, and eventually became my roommate, and now has wrote this book. Isn't that amazing? That's the power of the resurrection. Yeah, he's right down here. He was actually at our wedding. He was one of the ushers. Good old wedding. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. that cool. And so, this is all God at work. And then I look throughout history, you know, not only biblical, but, but history, and I, I think of like St. Francis. If you know anything about St. Francis, the guy was a spoiled, rich kind of playboy. <laughs> who got into all sorts of trouble. And then, through the power of God's resurrection, he was transformed. He had this come to Jesus moment. I think it was in a garden somewhere. I can't remember. St. Francis. I mean, the whole Franciscan order is based on this guy. So he went from partying to ministering to lepers. <laughs> Wow. Or maybe it should be like this way. I mean, I don't know. You tell me what could change a human being to go from partying 
to ministering to the likes of lepers other than the power of the Holy Spirit in God's resurrection experience. Transforming human beings like St. Francis. And I read the prayer of St. Francis every day. You know, Lord, let me be an instrument of your people. I mean, it's just an amazing prayer. You, it's like the Lord's Prayer. You can't get anything more concise as far as, far as ministry than the prayer of St. Francis. And then I think of, of Luther. You know, I think St. Francis, I think, was in the 1200s, if I remember right. And so we've got Luther about 300 years later, you know, who's, who's walking along this, this uh, field. He's in this open field. And this huge thunderstorm comes through, and it's lightning, and, and uh, thunder, and rain, and, and Luther is fearing for his experience. At that particular time in his life, he was going to become a lawyer to make some big bucks. Yes, lawyers made big bucks back then, so that he could support his father. That's true. His father wanted him to become a lawyer, not to help the people, so that he could make money to support his father when his father was retired. Okay, And so he was on his way to become a lawyer, but in this thunderstorm, he cries out to the resurrected Lord. If Jesus had not resurrected, Jesus, Luther would have had nobody to cry out to. Remember that, folks. In the midst of despair, we have a resurrected Lord to cry out to. So he says, um, Lord, save me and I would become a monk. And the Lord saved him, and he became a monk. And the rest is history. And I read part of Luther's devotion every day as well. Just amazing stuff. And then you think of people like I've talked about before in more modern times. I mean, I keep going back to Nicky Cruz, David Wilkerson. Read the, that whole story. Nicky Cruz was a big-time gang member in New York City back in the 50s, early 60s. Big time. Notorious. David Wilkerson was a little guy, I think, a little preacher from West Virginia, who, or, or something like, gets a call, or no, Ohio, I think, and gets a calling to go and preach to the gangs of New York. What insanity, except for the resurrected Jesus, would ask a small town preacher from Ohio to go to the gangs of New York City and say, I want you to preach to them? Mm -hmm. And David Wilkerson went. And he started preaching. And during one of his sermons, the most notorious gang leader of them all, Nicky Cruz, was converted to Jesus Christ. You don't believe in the resurrection, folks? That's just one story of millions and millions that have happened over the past 2,000 years. Why do we sit here sometimes and doubt that Jesus ever resurrected when there are so many stories just like Nicky Cruz. Just like Eric Dawson sitting in the Student Union building mm -hmm. when two angelic, no, two guys from campus, I mean, they were like two guys that I did, I mean, they could have been angels, I don't know. And through their sitting down and my conversion experience, I mean, the rest is history. I mean, that, that took place in, in the Student Union building back in 1974. And then in 1986, Linda and her husband and these two people right here came to Pastor Dawson after four years at LCM and said, uh, we want to know more about the power of the resurrection and the Holy Spirit. Pastor Dawson, you're great at using your OCD to clean up things. <laughs> and LCM, is that right? Needed a lot of cleaning up in all aspects, is that right? From A to, and I didn't do too bad of a job for four years, but they wanted to get into more, what? Resurrection stuff and spiritual stuff. And I took what they had to say to heart and went and got extra education, started Bible studies, and stepped out of what? The what? The pulpit. Remember that day? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I used to type my sermons word for word. Remember that show? I used to drive you nuts. Yeah. <laughs> type my sermons word for word. Then I used to get up there and read them. But in that particular day, I read my sermon to one half of it. And then the other half, I tore up that sermon. It was part of my, threw it away and walked out of the pulpit and never stepped back in since. 
If that's not the power of the resurrection, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. Think about it. I don't know. I don't know where it came from. It's there. That's the way it worked in me. It's going to work in you in a different way. So this past week, and I'll get done in just a minute here, <laughs> I got a call from one of my buddies that I've known for years, and he had a vision while sitting on the commode. <laughs> yep. That's where he does most of his reading. But God came to him and spoke to him on the commode. And he sent me a three-page email describing the whole scenario about how God is working through him and how he came to him in a vision through numbers. God was giving him numbers. And we talked. So, so the following day I called and we talked for quite a while about how numbers work in the Bible. And, and he said, well, Pastor Dawson, uh, you know, uh, uh, or he calls me Eric, he says, have you ever had uh, resurrection experiences? And I said, yeah, I mean, and I've, I've, I've witnessed them in, in a lot of people. And I talked to him about the, the Campus Crusade thing and the, the 1986 approach, you know, that we, and I mentioned those. And I said, also, there was this one woman uh, who, the night before she died, said that her husband was in bed with her the whole night. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, yeah, my husband was lying beside me all night, and he held me in the way that he used to hold me before he died. And I knew it was him. And I knew, um, and I know I'm going to him. But he was with me, Pastor Dawson, all night. Now, what am I supposed to say? Oh, no, no, no. You're stupid. You're dumb. That doesn't happen. No. Because I believe in the resurrection and the weird things that sometimes God. I says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And the next day she died. But she was embraced by her husband the night before she died because of the power of the resurrection. She knew where she was going. It's that type of stuff that is just beautiful. So I'm going to end with two resurrection jokes. <laughs> Every time I have to preach for Vicki, I end up with jokes. <laughs> Sent to me by somebody in this room. <laughs> Moses, Jesus, and golf. Jesus and Moses decided to play the course before anyone was out on the Sunday morning of the Masters Tournament, getting to Amen Corner and playing the infamous number 12, par 3, Jesus turns to Moses and says, Jack Nicholas used a pitching wedge to nestle it up next to the cup, so that is what I'm going to do. But Moses says, I think you need to use a 9 iron. I don't know nothing about golf, but that's... And Jesus says, if Jack can do, so can I. So Jesus proceeds to hit the ball off the tee, and sure enough, it lands short and rolls down the bank into Ray's Creek. Jesus says to Moses, oh, Moses, can you do me a favor and park the creek so I can get to my favorite ball? And Moses says, no, I told you to use the nine iron, but you wouldn't listen. So go get it yourself. Jesus proceeds to walk on to walk on to Ray's Creek and causes the ball to rise to the surface. He picks it up and walks on the creek back to Moses and the tee box. Now, by this time, the first grounds crew are approaching Moses, and having seen what just happened, one of the guys asks Moses, who does this guy think he is, Jesus Christ? And Moses shakes his head and says no. He thinks he is Jack Nicholas. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like a this, dad joke. Yeah, this is a little whiskey here. Just the end of the okay, this is the priest and the rabbi. You know priest and rabbi jokes never very well. Best friends since childhood, the Catholic priest and the rabbi often enjoyed vacationing together to the power of the resurrection. One year, they decided in the visit to visit the Holy Land together. Shortly after crossing the Atlantic, the pilot on the intercom gets on the intercom and tells the passengers that they have had a catas catastrophic control failure and that they were going to have to make a forced landing in the rolling fields below. The two clerics looked at each other, hugged, and assumed the braced crash position. The aircraft made a very hard landing, spun, and came to a stop. There were shouts and cries from bruised and injured passengers as the doors were opened and the emergency slides uninflated. 
The priest looked at his friend and saw he was only semi-conscious. Unbuckling the rabbi's seat belt, the priest dragged his friend to the door and onto the exit slide. And upon reaching the ground, they stumbled, ran from the smoking aircraft, and dived into a ditch just as the plane exploded. And the priest looked at his friend and gasped. I knew that when the time was right, he'd see the light and convert to Catholicism. The rabbi looked stunned and replied, why would you say such a ludicrous thing? Well, I saw you crossing yourself just before we crashed, oh. the priest said. Cross myself, the rabbi said. I was just checking to see if I had everything I'd need once we landed. Spectacles, testicles, wallet, pen. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
brings up to you just a little of what you were first given us. We pray that you continue to have the wisdom to use them uh, according to your will here on this earth to take care of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, it's time if you want to offer up some prayers out loud or in your hearts. Lord, thank you for keeping your healing hands on Ray and Carol and Kathy. Thank you for guiding both Ben and Ron as they protect our country. A special thank you for our amazing choir and all of their hard work every week to fill us with joy. Thank you for all the gifts you've given us. Well, I just want to give you thanks for the birth of Lucia. She's in good health. And in reality, that's really all that matters. Thank you, Lord. And so is Mom. Yeah. Um, we want to thank you for and pray for those around the world who are in uniform and, and fighting for freedom of all people. Father, we continue to lift up Mary Jo White. And so we continue to ask you, Father God, to um, bring James home and get word of him to his family. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we come to you as humbly as we know how. We confess our sins, those known and unknown. Lord, you know we are not perfect and we fall short every day of our lives. But we want to take time out to say thank you for your mercy. Thank you for our health, our families, our friends, the roofs over our heads, the food on our tables, and everything we have. Amen. 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 And the night when he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to them to eat. He said, take this and eat. This is my body given for you. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them for drink, saying, this is the, this is the blood of the New Testament. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his love, grace, and truth. Amen. Amen. Go to celebrate all that God has done as Christ breathes new life into you, sending you out with the spirit of forgiveness and faith for the life of the world. Amen. Amen. May you be filled with the grace of peace of God, who is and was and is to come, and with the spirit of Jesus Christ, God's faithful witness, who loves us and sets us free. Amen. Amen.